Kamagani. Kamagani. Being a Bikineri, all of us from the land of Bikana find this delicate dust known as Manote is a nuisance. It is something we dislike that comes into our havelis and into our temples. This causes a feeling of dirt hitting us, something we dislike. But in truth, this Manote is the foundation. It is the Jawahar that built Bikinir, the jewel in the desert. Definitely taking nothing except the will, the intellect, and the nishta to create a Naklistan in desert, a oasis in desert. In the mid 15th century, present day Bikanir was considered useless Registan. In the middle of nowhere, it was just the pile of sand and dust. It took the foresight and fortitude of Rao Bikaji and his uncle Kandalji to see the potential in the desert and making a new kingdom with the blessings of Karni Mataji. It wasn't until 1574 AD that the sixth ruler of Bikinir, Maharaja Rai Singh Ji, implemented a Olkan system that was strictly adhered to and followed by his descendants. These specifically were Maharaja Karan Singh Ji, Maharaja Anup Singh Ji, Maharaja Gaj Singh Ji, Maharaj Lal Singh Ji, and his brother Maharaja Sadar Singh Ji, that followed a system of connoisseurship that built this Jawahar of Bikinir. Maharaja Rai Singh Ji attached himself and the Bikanir kingdom to the Mughal Darbar. He became a trusted ally, gained immense power, and eventually became the joint subedar and governor of present-day Indian and Pakistani Punjab, Pakhtunkhwa, and Eastern Afghanistan, on behalf of Bikanirs and Mughal. Maharaja Rai Singh Ji's unwavering vision to make Bikanir a cultural capital, as well as financial and military power. Absolutely. Drove him to cultivate the finest artists and artisans to migrate to Bikanir in 1581 to 1586 AD from Herat and Multan, who are presently known as Usta artisans, from where the word Ustad comes from. Maharaja Rai Singh Ji patrons the building of the Junagadh Fort between 1586 and 1594. He establishes the tradition of the Bikinir school, starting the painting Karakana, the Nakashi Manuti uh, decorative art medium, and the system of the Ustas to produce the beautiful jollies, jarokas, and buildings of Bikinir in Dulmera red sandstone carving. This tradition of Bikinir thrived from circa 1600 until 1872. To accomplish this extraordinary fantasy, to make it a reality, he surrounds himself with other intellectuals. Specifically, this was other courts and the Mughal Darbar. To accomplish this extraordinary fantasy and to make it a reality, he cultivated and surrounded himself with other intellectuals and connoisseurs, specifically Rao Boj Singh Ji of Bundi and Rahim, who was the Khani Kanan for Akbar under the Mughal Empire. After Maharaja Rai Singh Ji, the next descendant who was a game changer was Maharaja Anup Singh Ji. He cultivated a darbar of intellectuals created one of the finest Sanskrit library in the world and patron paintings and new architecture to an apex level. Between 1745 to 1775, Maharaja Gad Singh Ji created, created a cultural revival and revolution, taking the thoughts away from Mughal sensibilities to a more indigenous and Rajput one. He patroned extraordinary talent cultivating the refined skills of the artists and artisans like Isa Usta, Sahabuddin Usta, and Kayamji Usta, who were master painters. Then the phenomenal apogee, the Anup Mahal, was fabricated under the patronage of Maharaja Gat Singh Ji. I would like Countess Shanane to throw some light on the beauty of Nakashi Manoti and how, how the room 
the beautiful room in the world was created, how this uh, <clears throat> work was created. Yes, Atiraj Bana. It is exceptional. It's one of the most amazing rooms in the world, and it is in our city of Bikinir. Before going into the details of the Noob Mahal, I would like to give our listeners and viewers a little bit of an insight of what did Bikinir look like at the end of the 17th century. At the beginning of the 17th century, we have Maharaja Rai Singh Ji, who wanted to make this a cultural capital. It wanted to be shown to everywhere within Rajputana, exactly. the Mughal Darbar, right. and also to the world that Bikaneer was a force to be reckoned with, that we had the most refined culture of any other Darbar. All the way to uh, Noob Singh Ji, Maharaja Noob Singh Ji, one century of developing this slowly, very meticulously, and with hmm. thought and perseverance. Exactly. The palaces, the temples, the mosques, the clothing, the accessories, the refinement of food, of, of, of language, of poetry, of treasury, all of this was at an apex level of human achievement. Imagine from the dust, this minote that we are speaking about, a city rose from the desert in this exceptionally beautiful Dulmera red sandstone. And unlike other sandstones found in the world, Dulmera red sandstone is quite special. It's acid resistant and it has a consistency and top quality to be very similar to wax. So when you carve jollies and jarokas from it, you get this beautiful sheen, exactly. delicacy that you cannot find in other sandstones. Also, with rain, wind, heat, or cold, this stone will resist any of the weather difficulties. How amazing. So now we have these palaces, large boulevards. We have men that are in beautiful clothing, lovely feren, which is the Bikinir turban. You have sarpeshes, you have talwars, khandas, you have zardozi decorating our clothing, you have pulki everywhere, basaramoti, lali badakshan, red spinels. Yes, the darbar is so refined that every single detail of sanskar and etiquette is followed. And as you pass through Bikinir, jaroka after jaroka, mandir after mandir, mosque after mosque, palace after palace, leads to the amazing Junagat Fort, the only fort in Rajputana that was not built on a hill. Maharaja Gaj Singh Ji wanted to give honor, he wanted to give respect, and he wanted to give his unwavering loyalty and nazar to his ancestor, which was Maharaja Anup Singh Ji. Uh, Maharaja Anup Singh Ji, he, he had a vision to not only show Bikinir in this cultural dominance, but also militarily, and he was in uh, sorry, he was instrumental in getting the Deccan for the Mughals. Without Bikinir and Maharaja Anup Singh Ji, the Mughals never would have conquered the Deccan. Huge amounts of texts, uh, Sanskrit uh, um, texts, Brajbash poetry, uh, you had uh, incredible treasuries, weapons, everything was coming back to Bikinir in huge quantities. With this wealth that established inside Bikinir because of him, the next ruler who saw this uh, ancestor and understood what he did was Maharaja Gaj Singh Ji. And with that cultural revolution that he started here, hmm. the one man he wanted to give the most honor to was to this ancestor. The Usta artisans who came with Maharaja Rai Singh when he was the joint subidar of the Punjab and uh, Afghanistan and Pakhtunkhwa, uh, developed this process of Nakashi Minoti. Now, what's special about Nakashi Minoti is that nowhere else in the world is this art medium found. It is only found in Bikinir. All the palaces in the Persianate world, all the way into Rajputana, into Central Asia, Nakashi is found. Nakashi is found. But you do not find um, Minoti. And this like... joint medium of Nakashi Minoti, which today in a colloquialism is used as Usta art, um, but properly it is known as Nakashi Minoti, was only developed here. Hmm. So Maharaja uh, Gaj Singh Ji, he started this concept of this room in the Junagadh Fort. And it took, from the beginning of the patronage, the idea and the implementation of it, it took 10 years before the room was completed. Now the way this was accomplished is you have two different types of chuna, 
uh, tuna is a natural limestone, and you will want to bury that in the ground to get it very, very hot, and you create this natural cement. Right. Now, interestingly, in erstwhile Rajputana, you do not have a way with the climate here, the type of soil to have foundations, which you would have in other parts of the world. Right, right. So if you want to look a good example, let's look at Mehengar Fort in Jodhpur, where that tuna was baked for two years, and then covering this huge rock, you basically start your foundation by gluing the sandstone onto the stone, and then you build upwards. With our Minote and the sand of Bikinir, again, the same problem. So you are going very deep, about 17 to 20 feet into the ground to build a structure of kind of crisscrossing to build upwards. That is one way of, the, of usage of the tuna. The second way of tuna is for decorative uh, purposes hmm. for architectural elements inside palaces, inside. havelis, temples, uh, forts. And that is accomplished differently. You would also be burying this tuna in the ground and you would have it heat up, but you would add one more element to it. You would take freshwater mother of pearl from mollusks of freshwater um, mollusks, uh, kind of like, um, I don't know, example, a mollusk would kind of look like an oyster, let's say, shell. Exactly. From freshwater, oyster. yes, yeah. they're beautiful. Mm. Uh, freshwater um, uh, rivers in uh, northern India as mm. well as in central India. Mm. And you will crush this shell down into a powder. And while you're baking this tuna, you mix all of this uh, mother of pearl into the tuna. Mm. While it is still wet and hot, you are plastering this onto walls. So even though here, let's say here's a plain wall, but let's say it's white, and you would do that while it's wet, and you would be moving it back and forth quite quickly. To make it more shiny. To make it more shiny. Once that had hardened and cooled, hmm. you would be left with these beautiful, pristine white surfaces that have gloss on them. And if none of you have seen inside Junagat Fort or Mehengar Fort for another example, the plain white walls, which you've probably never noticed before, take a very close look at them. They have a sheen of moti, of pearl, inside of them, and that's because that is what is inside that, that is. tuna. Exactly. So this room first was developed by covering all the walls and the ceiling with this decorative tuna with the mother of pearl mollusks inside. The second step you would do, I will show you some examples of, of what would be done next. This particular decorative uh, Nakashi Minoti object is a masterpiece. It took one year to be made, hmm. and it has both the medium of Nakashi and Minoti. And let me explain the difference. So as I said, the Anup Mahal was first covered with this architectural tuna. Exactly. And then afterward, after you had done that, the next step is you will have to make this embossed part of this. You see how that's three-dimensional and raised? Yes, yeah. That's the embossed part. And that is the Minoti, or the media of that. Of that. And that is produced from Minot. The which, dust which we are talking about. Yes, that amazing dust of Bikinir, which annoys everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this Minot, uh, the pottery community that was traditionally in this region mm. before it became the Bikinir kingdom, produced the Minot into pottery. And unlike other pottery traditions that use a clay, mm -hmm. the community here in this region were able to take this fine dust and create pottery from it. At some point, which we don't know, the new Usta artisans, when they came from Herat and Multan to Bikinir, noticed this process. Hmm. And they took it one step further by taking the pottery and crushing it again into powder, which into became powder. even finer than the fine minote, which is all over Bikinir. Okay. Then a proprietary method was developed by them to make an adhesive for this dust, hmm. taking different elements, the intestines of freshwater hmm. fish, different gund or, or gum arabics, and some other things to make this paste. They mixed the manote dust together and they were able to get this uh, material. Okay. Then very carefully using both brush, uh, kalam, traditionally known as a brush, which now is a pen, but a brush, and their hands, they would make this embossed pattern. And uh, I have a <clears throat> question. When the gold layer was put, it, what is the step for gold layer? Yes, the gold layer is done actually right after this embossing. Okay, the three-dimensional the three dimensional embossing is done first, hmm. which is that minote by hand and with the column. And then at that point, 
you will cover the whole material, such as in this box, uh, in gold leaf or a very thick sona barak. Either it's a, a item or it's a wall. You have to cover it first with the gold. Yes, and most people, when they look at Nakashi or Nakashi Minoti, hmm. they're assuming that the gold, because the way it looks, they believe the gold is added at the end. Hmm. Where actually, no, first the object or the wall or whatever you are decorating is exactly. first covered fully with the gold. Hmm. Now, the next step is crucial uh, to Nakashi Minoti and also to the Bikinir school tradition for the painting Karakana. Hmm. And I'll explain that. So the next point is it's very difficult to see, but maybe if you get a really good close-up, it's possible. You can see this very, very fine, dark line that is outlining the full Minoti, Minoti pattern. Hmm. Yes, and that's the Siyahi, correct? The hmm. Siyahi line or right. the first line. Now, this is a Persianate tradition that started in the Persian world and was brought into present-day India, Rajputana, uh, into the Mughal court. And I'll demonstrate what that means. I'll just give you that for a moment. Mm -hmm. We can put it down. So the Siyahi line is very particular. I'm going to use a pen because, well, uh, don't have a brush and is complicated with the actual Siya. But I could explain the Siya a little bit. Sia is lamp black, and the way you get traditional lamp black is you will take mulmul, a really fine muslin, from okay. the cotton of Bengal. Hmm. You will burn the mulmul, hmm. the muslin, until it's into a powder. You will have a small terracotta dish, and you will have that burnt muslin inside. You will then take different gum arabics and suresh, again the freshwater intestines, and you will crush this all together. You will also then take sona barak or sona uh, gold leaf and you will also crush it in there as well. And that's what it will give this delicate, beautiful, uh, very fine, if you can see the gloss on the black of that line. It's exactly. a very shiny, glossy black line. That's the gold that's inside the lamp black. The lamp black. And then you would use your brush or your, your column hmm. to start painting. Now I'll use an actual contemporary pen. But you need, you'd have your wrist like this and you would start it all the way back like this. So I'll use a paper here and put it here. Excuse me. And you're going to start your wrist all the way back And like it was this. Al always a test for an artist, yes, as you say. Yes, correct. So the yeah. Siyahi line is the test of a master artist. So in the Bikinir tradition, within the Karkana, each generation of Ustas would be testing their next generation to see which level exactly. uh, the next masters could be hmm. until uh, the family decided who would be the next in charge of the royal painting Karkana. And the next step, of course, would be for the Darbar to agree on that appointment. So you're going to start your, this is the movement, if you want to just kind of look like this. You know, you're doing like this, so all the way around. So I will try to do this well, yes. Uh, so you're going to start your highlighter, so here. And when you are turning your wrist, you cannot lift your hand at all to go around so that amazing yes so you can't lift it off of the object you're working on now of course my line is not as straight as a master uta usta painter but just to give you an idea of how, what that means the siyahi line and how important it is to bikinir tradition now the next step you would do is you are going to add the colors. Now, in the case of the Anup Mahel, you, are, you will see intense blues. Hmm. You will see beautiful greens. You will see incredible oranges and reds. Hmm. Now, the blue is two different uh, raw materials. One is lajwar or lapis lazuli, or known as ultramarine, ultramarine. which comes from the mines of Sarisang in Afghanistan. And that top quality lapis lazuli was brought to Bikinir. It was ground down into an exceptionally fine powder, hmm. and it was produced then for a pigment. And that is what makes this exceptionally intense blue of the Anup Mahal. The green is accomplished by oxidizing copper with gold. Copper with? With gold. With gold. So you've got the green here. You've got, here's the intense lajoir, lapis lazuli. That's there. Hmm. And the red is, can be a combination of different things. You have a red oxide, you have a red ar arsenic, um, crema donna, it's a seed. Hmm. So it depends on which shade you want to get. Hmm. The beautiful oranges, which I'll show you, um, 
are created using a sindur combined with gaugoli. Now, gaugoli is something that also developed only in uh, South Asian painting traditions, hmm. and that is produced when a cow is fed uh, mango leaves, hmm. and you wait a few days, and that's all you're feeding the cow, and then you collect the urine, the peshab, from the cow, and then you will take alabaster, which is a subspecies of the mineral gypsum, right. and you will soak the um, uh, gypsum, hmm. uh, or the alabaster, into this into this urine until it turns into a bright golden color. And then you'll, there's a few other parts of this, and then you will grind this down into a pigment. So this exceptional beautiful orange is a combination of the sindur and the gaugali to get this orange color. It is both a royal uh, Rajput uh, uh, traditional color as well as a royal Norman color. So different parts of the world where the kshatriyas are, it's the same royal color. Uh, so. At this point in the Anup Mahal, you have covered it with gold. You have made the embossing of the beautiful manot, or the manoti medium. And now you've done the siahi line, the black outline, and then you've added these exceptional colors. The last part of this is to put a layer of a linseed oil, or a flaxseed oil, that will protect it. Protect it. Now, to give you an idea how rare this room is in the world, uh, really? Again, here we are in Bikinir, people go, oh, Juna, good for it, parana, hey, whatever. And nobody really, really pays attention to Boss. how absolutely. So please, give an idea how rare the Anup Mahal is. What is the rarity of that place? Well, uh, to begin with, hmm. yes, this special uh, media of Nakashi Minoti. Right. It's solid gold. You have master artisans of the highest level of any darbar in the world producing this room under royal patronage. You have the highest quality materials, the lajwar from Afghanistan. You've got this exceptional pigments from wherever their origins are. And to give a comparison, mm -hmm. just to understand further, I will use a miniature painting from Bikinir. Okay. So this painting is of Lakshmi uh, being bathed. And if you don't know, Lakshmi is the goddess of the Bikinir state. Here is a miniature painting done in Bikinir. This was produced by Hassan Usta in the late 18th century, and it is of Lakshmi, the goddess, being bathed by elephants. Now, if you don't know, Lakshmi is the goddess of the Bikinir state, and Karni Mataji is the goddess for the Bikinir royal family. Right. Now, this is the size of this painting. It's produced in exceptional high-quality tin, in silver, in gold. It also has the sindur, it has nil, lajoir. And a painting like this would take anywhere from, let's say, four to five months to be produced uh, for the Darbar. Hmm. Now, this particular painting was in Junagadh Fort before, and then at one point, Maharaja Karni Singhji sold off some of the royal collection into uh, the marketplace, and this was one of the paintings in that sale. Now, something like this, like I said, took that many months to produce. Now, let's say this went for auction today, and it's going to be sold. Hmm. It's going to be sold in, in India, whichever auction house, or to a private collector. You're dealing with a few lakh rupees just for this size. Or now, sometimes even more, more than lakhs. Absolutely. So let's say we went with a big ear painter like uh, Hamid Ruknuddin exactly. or Natuji, which were the masters of the late 17th century. Hmm. A painting by them today at auction would go for hundreds of thousands of dollars or many crores per painting of the same size. Now, the reason uh, you asked this question is so that there can be a perspective of the Anup Mahal. Exactly, so that people know that how rare it is. Yes, yeah, so imagine this size painting. Imagine this size painting, this much time, this expensive materials patroned by kings. Hmm. And now you have a room that is, you know, 80 foot by, by 30 foot, yes, which would incorporate at least a thousand of these painting sizes. And that much work of the Nakashi Minoti and the painting is the same level of this fine art in decorative art. Exactly. So imagine the cost of the Anup Mahal to be produced today. One, it couldn't be. It would be priced prohibitively. The room is priceless. Hmm. Ari Rajbana, hmm. please let me know who was the next uh, main royal patron for Bikinir. By 1851 AD, 
Maharaja Sardar Singh Ji became the ruler of Bikaner. He and his brother Maharaj Lal Singh Ji, who was also the father of Dungar Singh Ji and Ganga Singh Ji, they were the last great patrons of all the Bikaner art masters and traditions. The last celebrated masters like Rahim Usta and his son Chotu Usta between 1795 to 1870 AD were cultivated by these royals. The magnificent, no, the renovation of the magnificent Karnimata temple in Deshnok was designed by Rahim yes. Usta and sanctioned by Maharaja Sardar Singh Ji to be built exquisite marble carving, solid carved silver doors, and elegant textiles to be adorned to the deity of goddess Karnimata. Yes, and unlike other Rajput kingdoms at this time in the late 19th century, the decline of material culture, of their painting traditions had already started. Right. But under Maharaja Sadar Singh Ji, he kept the traditions of Bikaner until the end of his reign in 1872 AD. The last additions to Bikaner were uh, the amazing havelis of the merchant traders of the interior part of Bikaner, uh, which were developed in the 19th century. 19, okay. uh, great examples of these, of course, would be the well-known Rampuria havelis. Hmm. Definitely, Maharaja Ganga Singh Ji was the last royal patron the magnificent palaces of Lalgar and Lakshminivas to be built, incorporating the elements of Bikaner tradition from 16th to 19th century. I would like Countess Shanin to conclude our talk about the Bikaner tradition in school so that people would know how important they are. Arirajbana, yes. Uh, the royals and the aristocracy of Bikinir understood that material culture hmm. was paramount to the society hmm. for the root, uh, how to create not just a society of beauty and elegance, but one that had an intellect and tradition. Uh, Maharaja Ganga Singh Ji also must have seen the writing on the wall that the Bikaner kingdom, that the Darbar was close to probably the end. Hmm. The British power in the subcontinent was waning and the whole thought process of a new democratic or republic of India in thought was coming. He put all of his family's traditions, Sanskar, Olkan, Nishta, together to create these lasting monuments in the Lalgar as well as Lakshmi Nawaz palaces. Definitely, I hope what we have discussed today will inspire more Bikaneris and others to see this city in a different light. And also for everybody to remember who are from the land of Bikaji, that the Manot is not a curse, it is what made our Jawahar. Thank you. Kamagni. Kamagni.